Uh, Dr. Faluki, thanks for joining us here today. I hope you're doing all right in these uh, kind of unprecedented times we're living through. Well, I'm, I'm hunkered down. Uh, been in the office some, but uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm in my home office, as you can see. The dental office doesn't look quite this cluttered, but uh, – <laughs> Got the, uh, if you look real closely over here, I actually have the 3D printer running in the background. So we're, uh, we're, we're printing mask frameworks, which I'm sure we're going to discuss at some point in the, mm -hmm. yeah, in the I process. Hear, I definitely want to hear all about that project uh, you've got going on sure. behind you. But first, you know, can you kind of tell me what it's been like in your practice the last couple of weeks since the ADA and the CDC asked dental practices to stop seeing everything but emergencies? Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, as as people know that have seen the the article that that uh, we put out at Dental Products Report, um, I think it was late last week. I was pretty miffed um, in general at the leadership, not just the leadership in dentistry, but the leadership in the whole healthcare piece of this in general, because nobody was giving us any, uh, good direction or decent direction. The direction I kept getting whenever I would explore or ask for direction was, well, use your best judgment. And what I've been telling people is, you know, as a doctor, sometimes what you should do is when somebody says use your best judgment and you don't have a best judgment then you should know when to turn to experts and and we just weren't getting that and so um one day a couple of i think it was a couple of weeks ago today i was in my office and i happened to be between patients and there was a task force um press conference being done from the White House and the uh, the lady that is uh, in charge of Medicare and Medicaid services was doing her portion and she said um, during her portion that we are asking for all elective procedures to be canceled going forward and that includes dentistry and that was the first time that I'd actually heard the word dentistry anywhere and I took some flack on social media because I said it was a mandate and everybody came back and said, well, it needs to have 17 signatures and it needs to be printed on goldenrod paper and other nonsense. But, but my response has been, if somebody's standing on a stage at the White House and you have Secretary Pence here, or I'm sorry, Secretary, Vice President Pence here and President Trump here, when you say something, I think that's probably as close to an official mandate as you can get without the paper. So when that happened, I, I literally turned, I had about three or four team members probably with me at the time watching it. And I, I turned and I said, we're done. And I had been sort of seeing patients, uh, you know, I wasn't exactly just doing emergencies at that point in time, but we were, we were seeing hygiene patients and, and not creating aerosols. So we were doing, you know, no ultrasonic scale. It was all hand scaling. Um, we were seeing some uh, dental patients, I mean, you know, patients that I would see um, under certain circumstances. But the minute that lady uttered the word dentistry, I was just like, we're done. And unfortunately, that also meant that I had to furlough six people. So the hygienists on my team were immediately told, um, you know, pack up and go home. There's, there's nothing for you to do, unfortunately. And um, that's been tough. We then um, tried to figure out what we were going to do from a standpoint of, you know, what procedures we were going to allow to be done. And uh, we've got a, We've got three dental assistants on the team. Two of those dental assistants self-furloughed at that point in time. One of my admin team self-furloughed. So we went down to um, one dental assistant, one admin team member, and three doctors. And the, uh, the two younger doctors, I'm the oldest doctor in the practice, so the two younger doctors went on, uh, went on call, literally PRN. So they only come in either when they're bored or when they're called. And it's it's been a real strain on things. I mean, we really haven't seen hardly anybody. I mean, our big things now are pain, pain, fever, and swelling. And those are the only things we're treating now. And it's been difficult. I mean, I've had uh, 
you know, everybody's applied for unemployment. Um, you know, we're looking at the SBA to try and figure out what we're going to do from a viability standpoint. It's been rough. Mm -hmm. In terms of just your practice itself, I know, you know, you are spending some time there. What are those days like? And, you know, besides seeing those emergencies when people come in with, uh, you know, pain, swelling or fever, what do you do while you're there? You know, there's a lot of organizing. Um, i I have a lot to do. I, mean, be, I, I I wear a lot of hats, and because of that, the the one thing that suffers usually is organization. And so I spent you know half a day cleaning out two drawers, literally in my office. Um, I've got the uh, the actual desktop of my office, which occupies three walls. That's pretty well straightened up now. Um, so I got that taken care of. Um, we've had to write protocols for the patients that we are seeing as far as what we're doing, how we're dealing with them uh, when they come in. Um, my reception room, we went through and removed all the chairs because we don't want anybody in the office that is not related to the actual procedure we're doing. So if you know, if someone brings someone to the office, uh, we're asking them to wait in their car. Um, so we had to, you know, straighten the, the, the waiting room up. We had to move all those things around. We had to come up with the protocols, put those in place, design forms that people, you know, have to fill out and other forms that they have to sign. Um, it's, it's been weird. I mean, we're in uncharted territories here. So we're just, you know, we're doing what we can. But I'm kind of at a point now where there's not a lot for me to do. I mean, I'm, I'm going in because I think I'm more productive when I'm there than when I'm at home um, mm -hmm. from a standpoint of getting things done, but I, I'm rapidly running out of things to do. And I'm sure everybody else out there is in the same boat as me. Yeah, and when I've talked with other dentists and other people in the industry the last couple of weeks, things I'm hearing is, you know, people are using their time to catch up on CE, especially if they have been planning to do it at, uh, you know, the Hinman meeting mm -hmm. that would in the other week or any of the other upcoming meetings that have unfortunately been canceled. And I've heard some people are, you know, doing some bench tests with new things in their practices. But, you know, even the dental labs I've talked with basically are saying they've got about a week or so more of work that was in house before everything started to shut down. And then they're going to run into uh, just lack of projects. So, you know, you mentioned the Small Business Administration and looking for support. Is this industry going to need that type of help to get back on its feet? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I when this all hit, one of the first things I did is, is you know, I know you know this, Noah, but but for mm -hmm. those that don't know me real well, I, I'm, in, I'm pretty data driven and I'm a why guy. So I always have to know why we're doing something or, you know, what is the reason behind this? And when this whole thing hit, one of the things I wanted, because people talk about, oh, you know, this industry is going to need loans and, and, mm -hmm. and bailouts. And my first thing was, well, why? So I started looking and then one of the great things about, you know, being computerized now in healthcare is you can look at your numbers, uh, you know, you can really drill down, pardon the dental pun, into things and, and really find information out. And so I looked at, okay, well, what percentage of my revenue is really related to things like pain, sweaver, uh, sweaver, pain fever, and swelling? And so I looked at those procedure numbers, you know, in my records and that's between, you know, 10 to 15% of what I do. And so dentistry is looking at an 85 to a 90% cut in revenues, cut in production. And I don't know of any business that can cut their revenues 85 or 90% and expect to maintain the status quo for very long. Mm -hmm. Um you know, everybody has some cash reserves and, and that sort of thing, or you should, but we're rapidly going to use those up. I mean, I can't, you know, my, my rent, my utilities, um, you know, on, on Monday, I went in and I had a patient who was swollen and in horrible pain and needed a root canal. Um, I went in, I did the procedure myself with no help, no assistant. Um, but I can't survive on one endodontic procedure a day. 
I mean, there's no way that I can support seven operatories and 4,300 square feet, um, you know, plus 15 employees on one root canal a day. I just, it's, it's impossible to do. So we're going to need help. And the bad thing about dentistry is that we are, you know, completely shut down in this thing. The only blessing I think that I have being in healthcare is at least in the lockdown, I'm considered essential. So I, I am mobile. I mean, I can at least drive to my office and have some fresh air, you know, blowing my face as I'm going there mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. But there's no or minimal revenue coming in from this. I mean, I certainly am not going to be able to make ends meet, you know, doing endo and, and cementing crowns. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. When you are dealing with the patients who are coming in with these emergency cases, obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic. It's, you know, highly contagious and dental practices are kind of a point where people have realized it's really contagious in a dental environment. You mentioned yes. hospitalization. What are you doing to protect yourself and your staff? You mentioned your waiting room already. Are there things you're doing any differently than you've done before? Or, you know, are we already pretty good about this type of thing in the dental industry? You know, I think we're pretty good at it. Um, you know, one of the things we are doing is we've got a standard questionnaire that we're, mm -hmm. you know, running through with patients. And it's, you know, the thing that everybody's heard of, you know, have you traveled outside the country? Do you have a cough? Do you have a fever? Are you suffering from any malaise? I can't think of everything on the form, but we are running through those things. And we've never done that piece of it before. Mm -hmm. um, from an infection control standpoint, every time somebody touches something, it's getting disinfected. You know, I mean, the minute, the way we're, the way we're scheduling right now is that, huh, let, let's say I have two patients scheduled for Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. We're not scheduling those patients simultaneously. We'll schedule one patient and then a block and then the second patient. So what we're doing is, uh, you know, patient number one walks into the office. Obviously, there's no place to sit down, which is fine because they're the only patient. Uh, the admin team member is uh, going to talk to them, maintain social distance, uh, fill out the questionnaire. They're going to take the, the patient's temperature, and we're going to record that. We're also recording everybody's temperature when they come in. So my mm. temperature is recorded every day. Every staff member that's in the office is. Um, and then as soon as they're done uh, with the questionnaires, uh, then the admin team member is taking the patient directly back to the operatory, seating them, then they're leaving, and then they're going back to their area and they're disinfecting everything. Uh, and then I come in and I am wearing an N95 mask um, and, you know, obviously gloves. A lot of times, you know, before I'd come in and I wouldn't have a mask on to start with, you know, you'd talk to the patients a little bit. And then if I was going to create an aerosol, I'd put a mask on. Um, but now, you know, the mask is on before I come in, the gloves are on before I come in. Um, you know, the minute the patient leaves, the minute the gloves come off, I'm hitting hand sanitizer. There were times, you know, when I would, uh, you know, see a patient, take the gloves off, throw the gloves in the trash. If I was helping my staff, I might then put another pair of gloves on and start helping break the room down. Now, every time the gloves come off, I'm going with hand sanitizer. Um, but I think we were pretty good at those kind of things in dentistry already. So I could see when this whole thing is over, maybe they make a requirement that we go to some type of N95 mask. But mm -hmm. as, as far as the things that we do, I mean, we're pretty good at cross-contamination already. I think a lot better than some aspects are of healthcare, other, you know, other professions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we never touch people without gloves on in my office at all. And I've been in, you know, lots of other offices where they're, you know, taking blood pressure and stuff and they're not wearing gloves. In my office, we would. So I think we're better at it than, than most. And I don't see a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. But there may be some. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing we know about this industry, dentists are very creative and crafty people. They find solutions to unique problems every day in what they do treating patients. But we're also seeing dentists step up to find solutions to some of the problems we're facing with this pandemic. And I know we touched on this, uh, you and I, when we spoke a little bit last week, that there's a dentist in Georgia that you had discovered that had a kind of unique approach to helping out with this and you've jumped right on with what he's doing. So 
Can you tell me a little bit about these masks that are printing away behind you right now? Yeah, um, the dentist's name, um, and let me check here and just make sure, because mm -hmm. I want to make absolutely sure that I'm getting him correct. His name is Mark Causey, and mm -hmm. he is an orthodontist in Georgia. Not, not sure of his exact location in Georgia, but uh, one of my associates texted me, um, I think it was Sunday night, and said, hey, have you seen this website? Um, Mark, Mark created a website called firedbycorona.com. Number one, I salute the creativity of that because I think <laughs> it's great. But what, what he did is Mark is an orthodontist and he has a 3D printer in his office. Somehow or another, he got the idea and, and it's genius of you know, what we do with our masks is we put masks on and, you know, they're either elastic or they're tie and we put them on and then when we're done with them, we rip them off our faces and we throw them away never to be thought of again and we go through masks like socks in dentistry. Well, what he thought of was, you know, the problem right now for a lot of people is the shortage of masks and in particular, the shortage of N95 masks, which are masks that filter, the reason it's the 95 is they filter 95% of matter out of the air. And what he figured out was that really the important part about a mask is how it filters, not the shape or, or whatever. So he came up with this idea of what if you could create a mask that you didn't have to throw away that you could just change the filtration medium and, and that's where the genius is so he went through and created an stl file which is a 3d file it's the it's the same way if you have a digital impression system in your office you know it, the itero stores the data as an stl file so he created this 3d stl file of a mask framework and the joy of the STL file is these are printable. So this is a mask framework that goes over the nose and mouth. He uh, actually designed little pieces on it here that will hold elastic, which you can use. You can use, you know, rubber bands or, or just little elastic things you can buy at hobby stores or whatever. And then this front part that you breathe through actually has a lip on it, which you can see. And the idea is that's where the filtration goes. And the genius, once again, of this is not only that, but you can go to Home Depot and you can buy HEPA filters, which actually filter better than an N95 mask. And there's a cylinder in this. This is made for a shop vac type situation but if you take that cylinder out and cut those plastic discs off the top and bottom you get this and then you trace the circle here and you create in rough form that which then you can put over here mm -hmm. this can be there's a lip here as i showed you earlier this filtration medium can be held in place by a ponytail uh, elastic and now you've got a reusable surgical mask or, which filters better than an N95. The nice thing about this is when you're done with it um, if you, you know, when, let, let's say that after an hour's use, you think, okay, the filtration medium's probably had enough, it's probably starting to fail, or will soon, you pull off the elastic, throw that into a biohazard bag, get another one, put it on the mask, and now you've got basically an N95 mask that is completely replaceable for every patient, every procedure, whatever you want to do. Um, the other thing is this box was $50. I have no idea how many masks I can make out of this, but it's got to be a decent number. So um, hats off to him for coming up with this. We're printing these as fast as we can. Um, I spoke with him this morning. I've been uh, messaging back and forth with Dr. Causey, and uh, he said that he's had some dental labs also pitch in to help with this, 
And um, because like you said a, a few minutes ago, you know, they're starting to look for things to do as well. Yeah. So they're pitching in and printing these using that design. And as of this morning, he said they've actually printed hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And people are contacting him about how can I get one? So mm -hmm. it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I think from what I've seen, people tend to wear, you know, some other mask over the top of it that's not necessarily with the same filtration, but to just try and keep things off the plastic so that you're, you know, not having... Exactly. Damage. Yeah, and what I'm doing with these um, mm -hmm. in my hands is I'm spraying these down with waterproofing mm -hmm. so that, you know, liquids beat up on it. It's going to beat up on it anyway because it's plastic, but I think it's probably just better to have something that makes it easier that way. And then plus you can wipe these down and clean them. Um, yep. But yeah, it's a, it's a great idea. And, and the problem has been, you know, the, we don't have masks and, and that's a real problem for people on the front lines, but this helps defeat that. And, mm -hmm. and I love the fact that it's an outside the box DIY thing. I, I have a, a patient who happens to be a good friend of mine, his son-in-law is a dentist, or I'm sorry, is a physician in Denver. I shipped two of those to him yesterday mm -hmm. with instructions on, you know, how to use them, how to replace the filtration medium. And it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's a great way that anybody that has a 3D printer can help out. And it's, it's a great outside the box way of fighting this thing, which, you know, that's mm -hmm. what we all need to do. Yeah. And I've, seen other instances of uh, you know dental companies with 3d printers using them if they have materials that are FDA cleared for you know intraoral use they're able to print swabs for yes other things so are there other ways that dental professionals might be able to be called upon to help as you know the healthcare industry works to meet the needs that this pandemic is causing in terms of the load on hospitals and things you know, I would think, um, I know that they changed or have uh, lowered some, some standards on laws now that are allowing doctors, or I should say physicians, um, I think to move from state to state so mm -hmm. that you can, you know, if you're licensed in one state, you can then move to another and help without having to fill out, you know, mounds of paperwork and that sort of thing. But I would think that a dentist, I, I think I'd be perfectly qualified to work in one of the drive-in testing centers that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I know about infection control. I know, you know, what to do and what not to do. And then from a simple thing of, you know, take this swab, you know, rub it here, drop it here. I mean, I think I could follow those instructions. I think there's a lot of things we could do. I, I wouldn't be opposed to, you know, cleaning toilets in a hospital, if it means that somebody else that's more qualified than I am can get on the front lines, you know, I'll do whatever I want. And I think one of the things that we probably, somebody needs to step up and do is come up with some way of setting up a website or something where people can contact and say, this is my skill set. Can you pair me with somebody that can use these skills? Um, which I think would be awesome. We're seeing kind of a similar thing in New York right now. Um, mm -hmm. I can't think of which one of the hospital ships, but one of the hospital ships docked in New York today. Yep. And I can't remember if it's the Mercy. I know we have two of them. But anyway, yep. what they're going to do is that hospital ship is not going to treat COVID-19 patients. They're going to treat other sick people, but their idea is that by treating other patients that would be tying up hospital resources, that frees up New York hospitals to be better able to deal with COVID-19 patients. So, you know, mm -hmm. a broken leg, for instance, might get transferred to the hospital ship where they're certainly capable of taking care of those kind of situations. And then that leaves the big, you know, land-based hospitals to deal with with the more infectious piece of this and i think that's what we need with just healthcare people in general i saw i saw an article this morning and i'm probably going to ruin the numbers but i want to say that new york has contacted like 60,000 um healthcare providers that are retired and said mm -hmm. hey would you be willing to come back in and help and a huge number of them have responded and said, you bet, just tell me where to go and what to do. And I think dentists would gladly do that. We've got about 
what, 150,000 dentists in the United States? And mm -hmm. like I said, I mean, I don't know anything about, you know, treating lower respiratory problems, you know, with any great knowledge, but I could certainly administer tests or break down, a, you know, an exam room and set it up for the next exam or, or whatever. And, and I'd be happy to do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like, you know, what's going to happen next is going to be up in the air for a while, but, uh, yes. you know, we, we definitely have an industry here with a lot of professionals who know a lot about working in an environment that's governed by infection control best practices, comfortable with PPE, and are going to have some time on their hands. So hopefully we find ways to keep you and all your colleagues busy and helping as you always do with keeping this country healthy. So um, yeah, I'm hopeful that uh, we find ways to, you know, take this dental space that is currently idle and put them to work helping because you guys, you know, you're there and you're ready to go. Yeah, it only takes, you know, a limited amount of time before, as the old joke goes, I'm digging a hole in the backyard, then digging another one and using the dirt to fill in the one I just dug. Mm -hmm. And then I go back and do the other one again because you don't have anything to do. Now, I've been, uh, I've been doing some webinars and, and some other things. I'm, I'm doing some work with a company um, that is getting ready to go through an FDA approval or an FDA meeting on a device. And so I've, I've kept myself pretty busy doing some outside the box things that I would have really struggled to have time to do before. Um, but I know not everybody, you know, wears as many hats as I do in this. And, and there are tons of us out there. We want to help. I mean, that's, you know, that's why you go into dentistry in the first place. You go into healthcare, to take care of people. Um, you know, there's a reason why they call it health care and not health earn. You know, it's not about the money. It's about the care. It's about the people. And I think the pe I think if you took a survey of dentists, you'd find that most dentists, and, and I would say probably a, a lot of our assistants and hygienists and, and admin folks too would say, hey, you know, point me somewhere. Tell me what to do. You know, I'm willing to do it. You know, I, I told my staff the other day, I told them, I said, I get it that, you know, as a, as a team member, maybe this scares you. And, and I get that maybe, you know, you don't want to, you know, come into the office every day or whatever. I understand that. I said, I look a little bit, my position is different. You know, when, and I, and I don't mean to belittle the people that are in the military, but, but I'm going to use that as an example. You know, when you go into the military, you can be an accountant, you can be a cook, but one of the things you do is you, you promise no matter what your job is that you will die for the country. You pro, I mean, you promise that you'll pick up arms if you have to and get shot at. And, and this isn't the same as that, but I do look upon what I do and my responsibilities as it's not about me. Um, you know, if the bullets fly, it's my job to go out there, you know, run towards the sound of the guns, as they say in the military and, you know, do what I have to do. And so I think that the people that have licenses, I expect more of us mm -hmm. than, you know, than just to sit around and say, well, gosh, I wonder when this is going to be over and what's in it for me. You know, it's, it's, it's not that way. And, and I think 99% of the dentists feel the same way I do. Mm -hmm. Well, well, see what happens i guess in the next couple of weeks but uh glad to know that uh you're keeping as busy as you can and that uh you're staying well and i uh, appreciate uh, you joining me on this uh video call this afternoon so uh you know stay well there and dr fluke thanks very much for joining us we'll, we'll talk soon you're welcome Noah. thank you yeah let's i got nothing but time let's do this again One.